So this section is on copy number and analytic event measurements from SNP arrays. So what are the basic principles of SNP arrays and how do they differ from uh, array competitive genomic hybridization or ATGH? Um, in both methods, the copy number, DNA copy number is measured based on a log ratio, a ratio of a sample to a reference. In ATGH, that is performed in a competitive hybridization. So there is usually a two channel, uh, green and red, and the, the experiment is compared at every probe to a matching uh, reference signal. Um, with SNP arrays, there is no uh, competitive hybridization. It's um, a pool of normal samples that are used, and each experiment, every probe is measured against uh, that probe from the pool uh, intensity, uh, since it is a single channel type of a measurement. Um, now, therefore, it might have some drawbacks as far as calculating the log ratio. On the other hand, the SNP array uh, gives you additional information from the genotype data. Um, so one of that um, many advantages, one advantage is you can detect or use the loss of heterozygosity, for example, with a loss to say, oh, yes, we have a loss because we also observe the loss of heterozygosity. Um, you can also detect, so in addition to be able to be another dimension for copy number, you can also detect events such as copy neutral LOH, where the copy number doesn't change, but you have loss of heterozygosity as well as LEDK imbalance. And finally, it's very useful in detection of hypoidy or aneuploidy and multiclonal samples. Um, so getting more into the details of this, when you have a, a sample under um, study, uh, a diploid human sample uh, has two copies of the DNA, one inherited from the mother, one inherited from the father. So at every point, at every SNP, you have a genotype that can be either an AA, so you've got an A allele from uh, father and mother, uh, AB, where it's heterozygous, or BB, and again, homozygous, but with a minor allele, B allele. So if you read across what I've uh, had this cartoon here, you get an AA, AB, BB, AA. And if we plot this on what's called the B allele frequency, where down here the B allele is 0%, this is 100%, you end up with three states. You either have zero B, you have 50% B, like in this case an AB, a heterozygous, or 100% B, again a homozygous. So the homozygous bars are the rails above, and the heterozygous is in the middle. Now, what happens if there is a loss, so let's say this portion loses the, the mother uh, piece, of the DNA. So you only get Bs or As. So you end up with 100% or 0%. So you either get 0% Bs or 100%. Um, and then again, this is normal. And what happens when you have a gain, one of the alleles gets uh, added. So in this case, it's a trisomy. So the father allele got added. So you have either no Bs again or all Bs, so 0 and 100%, but then you don't have 50% because there's this imbalance between the alleles. You either have a one-third or two-thirds B. So you end up with four bands like this. Now imagine if you had four copies and it was balanced, so if it also uh, gained another mother copy, you would have four A's, and then uh, it would be impossible to distinguish if it was balanced between a normal and um, and four copy state. So I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here. So now that uh, that was the basics, how do you identify these regions of LOH? Um, in the Biodiscovery Nexus software, we use um, this approach, which is fairly generic. Uh, you can define a homozygous cutoff threshold. So you could say that anything above 0.5% 
80% the allele frequency or the symmetric also may be 20% below, uh, you can consider these probes as homozygous. And then you can create a homozygous frequency threshold. So let's say if you have, in this case, there's five probes that are heterozygous, maybe noise. And then you could say, okay, well, if I have 90% or more homozygous, this region should be called homozygous. Um, so this is the how to identify LOH regions. For allelic imbalance, it's somewhat similar story, except uh, you want to be not under 50% bar. So you have a heterozygous imbalance threshold. Let's say by default we use 40%. So anything below 40% to 20% here, this region and above purple line to the yellow line, that's the allelic imbalance bar. So if, uh, if you end up with probes in that area, then you will have an allelic imbalance. Um, now, how does the, this actually happen with the calling algorithm? So if historically, if you go back several years, um, a common method of calling SNP array uh, copy numbers were done with Hidden Markov models, uh, like 10 CMV versus suite and Qantas Um These methods have one state, and we've covered this in a previous uh, webinar. Um, for each of the copy number states, like normal, one copy loss, one copy gain, uh, what they have done for the SNP arrays is add an additional state where you have copy neutral LOH. So your copy uh, number is two, but um, it's an LOH event. So it essentially only adds one additional state to the HMM model. And then the BLE frequency profile is used to corroborate a copy number event. So if you have an evidence of LOH with a low log R, then um, you say, yes, this is uh, really now confident that there's a loss. Or if you have an allelic imbalance and increase in the log R, you get more confident that there's a gain. Um, it works quite well for many of the constitutional anomalies uh, because you expect these uh, integer essentially copy numbers and events. It works uh, not good at all with uh, mosaic or multi-clonal samples where things don't fall into nice uh, copy number bits. So what happens? Uh, why is that the case? What happens when you have a mosaic uh, loss or a copy neutral LOH mosaic one. So at 100%, if you have all the cells um, in your samples lose one copy, as I showed before, you, you expect to get banned here at the bottom or at top. But as you have some normal uh, samples in it, so let's say if it's a tumor and you have normal um, contamination, so here at 75, then you get two bands that are coming in from the normal amount. And as the percentage of the aberrant cell goes down until there is no aberrant cell, you end up with a three band situation here. So um, one method actually of determining the level of mosaicism of sample is to plot this out and look at where this band is and try to estimate the, the percentage of the, the tumor. Now, as far as making uh, the calls, we have a couple of algorithms that uh, by discovery have, have used. One is called SNP rank segmentation, which was covered before. Uh, well, the rank segmentation. And the SNP rank is just uh, addition to that basic principle where this genome is segmented based on the distribution of the probes. Um, in this case, we consider both the log R and the BLE of frequency jointly in making the segment. Uh, although they're not really strongly tied together, unlike the, the HMM model, uh, this allows the software to be able to, or the algorithm to be able to handle some of the mosaic and multi-clonal cases, just looking at the distribution of the probes. Um, the other algorithm is the SNP fast 2 which is our uh, most commonly used default method now. And this is uh, an HMM model uh, that takes a combination of log R and BLE frequency, but unlike the typical HMM, um, it doesn't uh, just add one state. I think the number of states goes up to about 96 different states to be able to handle all sorts of different combinations um, 
of copy number and allelic changes. So it can handle the mosaic and multi-clonal cases. So before uh, going to the other sections, I would like to present a live demonstration of the concepts here with this example. So I have a case. I have this uh, single sample here that I'm going to view. And uh, I marked it as a, as a mosaic. So if you, if you look at this sample um, here, let me go to the whole genome. Actually, that's easier. Zoom out a bit. So what uh, you see here that the sample has a gain of chromosome 7. This is a glioblastoma sample that's known to have a trisomy 7. And the monosomy 10, a deletion of 10. And the red bars here indicate, if uh, you've watched other webinars on the fast segmentation, uh, a one copy loss state is defined to be between the, the red bars. A one copy gain is defined to be values within the, the blue bars. And anything between the first red and the blue here is normal. Now, these settings are set for more of a constitutional or non-mosaic sample. And I should point out this uh, array is the Oncoscan, Appometric Oncoscan, and the data here is in linear scale, not the log scale. So uh, one copy loss would be a minus one, and a one copy gain would be a value of one. So if you look here, right, um, the definition or the way this is set up is we're looking for losses that are between minus 0.8 to minus uh, 1.8. So we're looking really for about 100% uh, of cases to have that. So this barely makes that. There's also a small uh, deletion here that's clearly about 50% mosaic. That's not pick being picked up at all. So if I go to the overview, um, explain this color, the red here indicates a loss and blue indicates a gain. Purple says allelic imbalance. So if I go to chromosome 1, you can see that the log ratio does dip down, and there is an allelic imbalance that's uh, being displayed, just like what we showed before about being a mosaic loss. But because the threshold is set so high, it's not being called as a loss. So, and then if you go to chromosome 10, where there is a monosomy, since this is right at the minus 0.8, you don't get a nice consistent loss. It's, it's almost a loss, sometimes, sometimes not. So in order to fix that situation, all you need to do is bring down these thresholds. So if I bring it down to minus 0.4 for a one copy loss, so it goes from minus 0.4 to, let's say, minus 1.2 for a one copy loss, and for a one copy gain, to so say, go from 0.4 to 1.2, and save this. I'm going to duplicate this sample and uh, apply the new settings to this sample. Now that it's been processed, you can see that now this loss is, is coming up quite well. And um, the loss here on chromosome 10 is nice one piece and same with this uh, loss of 13. So um, if, let's go to chromosome. One, I want to point out the other flip side. So as we brought down the, the threshold, so I'll show you the probe might be. So you can see now that this the red bar is being moved up, is catching all of this as being a loss, and it's catching this as being a gain. Um, but this area here, there are a number of events now being detected that might or might not be true. So if I look at the probes, you can see some of these, like, like the area here, overlap DGV. So this is probably a real gain event that's now being picked up. But some of the other ones in the middle are various, probably noise. So if you're trying to bring down the threshold to pick up more mosaic samples, uh, it's recommended to also make the significant threshold more stringent. So let's say make it 1 to minus 8. So it reduces those possible false positives. So I'm going to duplicate this sample again and reprocess it. Let's go to chromosome 1. 
you can see now that we have fewer, some of these uh, false positives have, have gone away and the rest of them seem to be real uh, copy number gain events. So that's uh, what I want to cover as far as uh, handling mosaic cases.